Okay, my friends, here we are. So I forgot to mention this in the last video. This is the 11th Sunday in Ordinary Time. We're back in Ordinary Time, which we actually technically have been in Ordinary Time for the last couple of Sundays, but it's just that there were special solemnities that take place within Ordinary Time. Uh, but like if you've been going to Mass during the week, You'll, you've known that the priest has been wearing green uh, when it's when there's not a saint, you know, that kind of thing. So, so anyway, so we're in the 11th Sunday of Ordinary Time in year A. So this is important for us to know, actually, because remember that the church reading cycle, the liturgical year, we're in year A, and during Ordinary Time, um, it's, it's like sort of slowly walking us through the Gospel of Matthew. And... Um, so we, we missed a chunk. If you remember way, 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 way back before Lent began, we had been getting into the Sermon on the Mount for a few weeks and talking about Jesus' instructions to his disciples, basically showing them how to be disciples. And now we, we finished that, or we, we didn't actually get to finish it, but that finished. And then a few other things actually took place. So um, just, just to provide a little bit of context before we get into the reading. Um, so the Sermon on the Mount is Matthew chapter 5 through 7. And then after that, Jesus, he begins basically his ministry in Galilee. He, he begins just like going out and he's doing all things. He's, he's healing people. He's cleansing lepers. He's, uh, he's, he's preaching. He's, he's healing. Lots, lots of healing. Lots and lots of healing. He calms. He changes the weather. He calms the storm at sea. Um, more healing. He calls people to follow after him. There's a, that sort of powerful scene where he calls Matthew. Matthew's, you know, at this tax collector, this filthy tax collector. And, and you know, Jesus like points. He's like, follow me. And he, he gets up immediately and he follows. It's incredible. Uh, he's questioned a little bit about, you know, like, what's the deal? Like, why, why do your disciples not fast? But John the Baptist questions uh, uh, disciples do fast. Like, what's that about? Anyway, then he, he continues this. Okay, now we get to our reading uh, in, in chapter 9, verse 36. And we finish up chapter 9 and we go into the first eight verses of chapter 10. So it is Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through chapter 10, verse 8, where we hear this. <laughs> At the sight of the crowds... His heart was moved with pity for them, because they were troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Then he summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, James the son of Zebedee and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Jesus sent out these twelve after instructing them thus, Do not go into pagan territory or enter a Samaritan town. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. That's so good. That's so, it's so Okay, so what's going on first? So let's back up just one verse. Verse 35 says this, that Jesus went around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel, curing every disease and illness. So in other words, what's going on? Well, you can imagine anytime somebody does this kind of thing, especially at this time where they're, they're, they're looking for the Messiah. Anytime someone does this kind of thing, though, it attracts crowds. Like, oh, man, this guy's doing amazing. Like, he cured my mother-in-law. He cured my, 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 my arm, you know, whatever. Like, he did all kinds of amazing things. Um, let's follow him. So that's exactly what's going on. So now he's got these large crowds coming, and he looks out at the crowds, and he's just like, what does it say? His heart was moved with pity, for they were like sheep. They were troubled and abandoned, like sheep without a shepherd. As it's... it's it's a sad deal, which, so it's fascinating to me because we saw in the Old Testament uh, reading from our first reading that um, the Lord has called his people to follow him, to remain faithful to his covenant. And, and if being faithful to his covenant, they will be dearer to him uh, than any other nation. And he says, you shall be a you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So that's, that's the thing. And then we know in the Old Testament that, that the Lord establishes um, something of a hierarchy or, or at least, you know, a, a, a way of leadership where there are people who are in charge of tending to the temple and there are, there are you know, different, different people who are in charge of 
teaching and, and preaching, leaders of the people, you know, these the kings, right? There's kings and, and priests of the, you know, all these different things. And these were all put in place by the Lord for a purpose, which is so that his people could be led appropriately so that they could look at their leaders and see like, this is how God governs. This is how God teaches. This is how God sanctifies. And, and yet here we are after the Lord has established all of that. And he looks at them and because they're troubled and abandoned like sheep without a shepherd. The Lord had established a system for them to, to have shepherds and, and it, something happened, something went wrong. So that now Jesus comes and he's just like, oh no. And in fact, we know this, that other parts in the gospel, Jesus really gets into it with the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these leaders who seem like they're motivated more by their political stances than, than by a true love for the Lord, a true love for the Lord's people. Um, and this is, this is just sad to Jesus. His heart is moved with pity. So that leads him to say then what? The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. What, is, what does that mean? It means, look at this. Like, I'm, I'm one person. Of course, I mean, he's a divine person, of course, right? But, but he's like, look at this. I, I'm, I come and I simply point people toward the kingdom of heaven. I, I simply do the work of God and, and look at all these people. And the harvest is so abundant. Like, it's, it's, it's the Lord, the people are ready to, to receive from the Lord. And, um, but he says, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Uh, this is, this has traditionally been, um, interpreted to be like the Lord, uh, or interpreted as, as the Lord's call to us to pray for an increase in vocations to the priesthood specifically. Um, but, but also just like an increase in vocations to, to for the Lord to raise up holy leaders, good and holy leaders, whether it's priests, I mean, specifically priests, but also like, you know, good youth ministers, good, uh, good parents who can raise their children to, to live godly lives. Um, you know, whatever it is, people, people called to go on mission for the sake of the kingdom, uh, to go to work for the Lord, to bring about a great harvest for the, for the Lord and his kingdom to be missionaries and, and, and priests and, and religious and, you know, all these different things. Um, so anyway, so this, I think is, is just a really good invitation for us to make sure we're praying for that, to pray that the Lord would, would interrupt people's lives, that he would, you know, invade with his grace and, and, uh, and inspire people to choose the priesthood and then to pray that the Lord, the Holy Spirit would give those people courage to respond as the Lord desires them to, you know, because we have a part to play in this too, that, that we, we have free will. And so even though we might sense an inspiration from the Lord, we can still choose something else. Um, and, and that's a sad thing, but, but we know that that's the case. So we got to pray that the Lord would continue moving in people's hearts, uh, and then moving in such a way that they are able to respond courageously. Um, as, as they hear that call. Okay, so anyway, so there's that. So, but then, what does he do? So he says, ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers. And then the very next thing, right? So this is where the, the chapter break is. The very next thing is what? He calls his disciples. So he's kind of implying that he's the master of the harvest, or, or at least he has a share in being the master of the harvest, which I suppose makes sense, right? That the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus is the Son. They're, they're all one God in three persons. And so it makes sense that Jesus would have a share in being the master of the harvest. Um, so, so anyway, here he is then calling them and doing what? What does he do? Notice what he does for his ministers. Those he sends out, he does what? He gave them authority. This, this is important. I know that I've spoken about this before, but Jesus doesn't just send out people to fend for themselves. He sends out his ministers with his authority. Authority to drive out demons, uh, to drive out unclean spirits, to cure disease and illness. And then, of course, we know there's other authority to preach and teach. He says later on, whoever hears you, hears me. So he sends them out with his authority to, to drive out demons, to, to perform miracles. He sends them with his authority to preach and teach in his name. So that ultimately, when, when people are, when the disciples, the apostles, as they're listed, are, are preaching, it's like the people are hearing the words of Jesus. It's incredible. Okay, anyway, then there's the name, the, the list. And, and you'll, you maybe have noticed this, that there are um, lists in all four of the Gospels, or three of the four Gospels, maybe. And um, the lists aren't always exactly the same, but there are some things that are always exactly the same. First is that the first apostle listed is also always Simon Peter. He is very clearly the leader of the apostles. He's the first, right? So notice this, first Simon called Peter. And then always last is Judas Iscariot with a note that says, who betrayed the Lord. 
Um, so th that's that's just like the the main steady thing. I mean, there's other things. You know, James and John are always in there. Uh, Andrew, you know, all these all these different people. But but um, sometimes the list the names are a little bit different, and that's because sometimes Jewish people went by different names. Um, you know, they had multiple names. You know, that kind of thing, or nicknames. You know, that kind of thing. So anyway, notice though that it says what there are twelve. Why why do you think there are twelve? Well, because there are twelve tribes of Israel. So the Lord again, He's coming to do something new. The Lord, his mercy is always new. His grace is always new. It's always renewing. But he's not doing something so new that that it it's totally disconnected to what he's done in the past. He is bringing about a new Israel. There are 12 tribes of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, and now he's bringing about a new Israel, and he's sending them out to do what? To go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we know later on that the Lord eventually uh, inspires them through the Holy Spirit to go and preach and teach to other nations, but, but his mission first is to the Jews, to the Israelites. Um, and and St. Paul mentions this in Romans chapter 1, uh, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to those who have faith, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Um, so so the, the first, the primary mission is to go to the Israelites, the lost sheep of the house of Israel, because it is it is the prophets who promised that the, the lost sheep of Israel would be brought back into the fold by the Lord. And so the Lord doesn't force them to come back into the fold, but he knows that they they have first dibs, we could say, you know, like they, they get first shot. And it's not like it's not like the kingdom is limited and you know, whatever, but 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 nonetheless it's like, okay, my first priority is is to bring um bring my people back. Like this this is it. And we see this actually play out in the Acts of the Apostles. Um and, and some some uh Saint Thomas Aquinas, that's who it was, he says this that the Lord is being faithful to the faith of the fathers. Who are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, Moses, and David, right? The, these are the fathers of our faith, and the Lord is being faithful to their faith. Um, and so, so he goes to their people first. And then later on, of course, he goes, he goes to these other things. Uh, notice also, what, what does it say? So as you go, make this proclamation. So what, what, is it, what are they to preach first and foremost? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, which is exactly what we hear Jesus preaching. It's exactly what we hear John the Baptist preaching earlier in the gospel. So it makes sense that Jesus would send out his ministers with his authority to preach the same message and then to perform these miracles, to accompany their preaching with signs and wonders, curing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing lepers, driving out demons. These are all things that we've seen Jesus do earlier in the gospel of Matthew, even sometimes just, you know, a, a few sections prior to this. So they're, they're doing what Jesus has done because they're carrying his authority. And then he drops this line, which in some ways is, is uh, it's a bit challenging for anyone who works for the kingdom, anyone who works for the church or, or shares in the mission is, what does he say? Without cost you have received, without cost you are to give. Um, this, this is something that's actually a bit challenging if you think about it, because priests make money, missionaries uh, oftentimes will raise their, their money. Um, the thing is, I suppose that it's not like an exacting thing, um, but in some cases it is, you know, like for me as a diocesan priest, I go into a parish and there's a set salary um, and, and different dioceses have different salaries that are set for their priests. And there's an expectation that the priest would be given that money. So in some ways it's just like, gosh, every time I read something like that, I'm just like, hmm, have we strayed from this? I don't really know. And there's maybe not a satisfying answer, but certainly not in a 15 minute video. So with that, we'll just leave it. And uh, we'll, we'll see here, the Lord, he's, he's, he's calling his people, you know, so what, back in the first reading, what's he doing? He's establishing his covenant with Moses and he's, he's, um, he's choosing his people, his chosen, his, his beloved, the ones who are dearer to him than all other people. Uh, and now what's he doing? These people, you know, this is, this is Moses, you know, a long time before Jesus comes. I don't, I don't know the number of years, but a long time. And, and there's a lot of history that takes place, a lot of sin, the exiles, all these things. And it can seem very easy from a, a sort of outsider perspective, like the Lord has forgotten or he stopped caring about his people, those people who are so dear to them, you know, maybe because they weren't faithful to the covenant. But now Jesus comes and he's showing them that they still matter to him. Uh, that he wants to save them, that he wants to bring them back into the fold. And and in so many ways, now he has come with a body. Before he had no body, now he comes with a body and he, he models for them how to remain faithful to the will of the Father. And in so many ways, we know this, that Jesus is the one mediator between God and man, and, and he is the one who is faithful to the Father. Uh, even as he himself is divine, he is also human. And so he shares in this this sort of 
incredible thing where, where he plays the part of God and, and he plays the part of man, uh, the part of God where he comes and sacrifices himself and calls his people, uh, but also the part of man where he remains faithful to the will of the Father. It's, it's Jesus. It's, it's who he is. And, and now he invites uh, his disciples, his apostles into that mission by commissioning them. Mm, incredible. Okay, we'll see you for the next video. Peace.